Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I appreciate we're approaching lunchtime, so stomachs will start rumbling. If you hear any rumbling coming from me, then I apologise uh, in advance. Um, what we're going to be talking about this morning um, is, is in two parts, really. The first is uh, conservation management of historic vessels, looking at the utilisation of uh, 3D data for information modelling. Boats and ships is my bag, so I'm going to be talking about some of the projects that I've worked on uh, formerly with Headland Archaeology, but also now with Wessex Archaeology. And then uh, my colleague Damien will be talking about the information modelling side of things, looking particularly at HMS Victory, um, which will be a, a small case study. So, conservation management, in a nutshell, is understanding the significances of an asset and then understanding how you can retain those significances through effective conservation management. And when we look at historic vessels, they can be small inshore craft, rowing boats, right up to 20th century warships. And that just gives an indication of some of the examples uh, of the types of assets that we could be dealing with. So from a 3D survey perspective, they can be quite simplistic, but they can also be very challenging. The first example I want to use is the uh, emigrant clipper ship City of Adelaide. Uh, formerly at the Maritime Museum in Irving on a slipway next to the main museum site uh, and is now based in Adelaide in South Australia after um, an action group managed to actually save the ship. But the circumstances behind the survey, uh, which was undertaken by Heaven Archaeology, uh, was really to um, respond to an application that the museum had put in for the deconstruction of the vessel in line with the guidelines from National Historic Ships. Uh, so as a result, um, Heaven were commissioned uh, with, with myself directing the project to um, do a laser scan survey of the ship, primarily as an archaeological record before deconstruction. But that kind of changed um, because the action group in Adelaide had managed to save the ship and ultimately they were going to take the ship back to Australia. Obviously with all the engineering requirements that was a big job. So the data was actually then used to help with that process, understanding the nature of the site in Irving, but also understanding how they were going to produce the cradle uh, to put the ship on to then put it into the, onto the barge and into the ship to then transport it to Australia. So a big, big exercise. In terms of outputs, very simplistic, very much in the 2D realm. Uh, but as you can see, um, they, they give a good um, overall coverage of the archaeological components of the, of the ship, uh, which was the first objective. And then later on, the uh, City of Adelaide Action Group, they actually used the data and their engineers used the data to inform the construction of a cradle to put the ship on. And then you can see their rendition down the bottom left of that, the, the one on the right is just the basic site conditions, so the scan was able to obviously include all that detail as well. Um, and then an image top left showing the cradle um, prior to the ship uh, being uh, transported onto it. So that's, that's the city of Adelaide. Um, the second one is the HMS Caroline, um, the last extant survivor of the Battle of Jutland, uh, built in 1914, uh, a a light cruiser, uh, much bigger, much more complex, lots more to deal with. So again, we were in a position where we needed to understand the current state of the vessel in terms of the spaces and compartments and various elements to help us then create working plans and sections and profiles for us to be able to, to undertake an effective recording and survey exercise. So this is the basic scan, it's just the point cloud, there's no uh, photo, photographic stitching, no photographic rendition, it was just the point cloud, and that's all we needed. So uh, we, we had the survey undertaken, and then again, very much in the 2D realm, as I said, uh, we've got the translation of the laser scan uh, cut-throughs onto the, the plans which we then used to understand the various areas and compartments on the ship, the various depth levels, and also be able to understand the phasing of those various parts as well. So a very simplistic but effective way of helping us to undertake um, that, that very complex recording exercise. 
that's another example of the profile um, cut through uh, profile of the ship at the various deck levels and you can see there there's quite a lot of compartments in various areas to have to deal with so uh, again very complex but the output again is very simplistic but another really useful tool was once the conservation management plan had been undertaken and the curators and managers for the vessel uh, had actually started the restoration process, the ship was being restored back to 1916 Battle of Jutland uh, appearance as much and layout as much as possible. Um, as part of the uh, ongoing restoration works, there were historic features that needed to be looked at archaeologically and recorded because a lot of these features were being removed whilst the work was happening uh, so that they could be um, preserved and conserved as well. So this is the deck in the starboard way, so you can see the area there on the top uh, plan just to show where we're, where we're talking about. And then the photogrammetric re renditions below, uh, the top one being um, the deck planking uh, from the starboard waste area, which is supposed to date to uh, the 1916 period. And then the deck plating underneath, once the planking had been lifted and this had left, relict remains of various um, various gear, um, guns, torpedo tube, mountings, all that sort of stuff. So it's a really useful exercise. And this was done whilst the, the contractors were, were taking the planking up, we were working with the contractors, lots of time constraints, uh, but a really easy, effective way of recording uh, what is relatively complex, uh, but in a very short space of time and not getting under the contractor's feet. Now, moving to the vernacular, um, we recently completed a conservation management plan for the Scottish Fisheries Museum and this is looking at the museum fleet as a whole but we did do a number of individual conservation plans for some of the vessels in the collection. Uh, the one that you can see there on the left is the um, Zulu Sailing Heritage uh, Sailing Herring Drifter um, uh, research and back in 2009, um, Headland Archaeology undertook a laser scan survey because it's a static exhibit now in the museum and they were concerned about the condition and structural integrity of, of the, the hulk, uh, which is essentially a hulk. Uh, and so they wanted the survey to provide a baseline from which they could then understand any future movement uh, or, or deterioration in the, in the hull itself whilst on display. So the, the laser scan was undertaken. Now as part of that, we wanted to understand what the whole shape should be and what it is in reality. And so in order to do that, we used a builder's half model, which is in the museum collection, which you can see in the bottom photo. We scanned that to provide the control. Uh, that model is actually from the same yard and the same period that the research was constructed in Shetland. So about the best uh, opportunity we had to, to provide that control, which was very useful. So, as a result, we came up with a, a relatively simplistic um, number of sections through the vessel from bow to stern. <coughs> and you can see there in the, in the purple, that's the, uh, the, the blocked out elements of the model for the control, and then the black lines show from bow to stern or bow to sort of midsection how the um, the actual reality of, of the whole is within the museum exhibit. And you can see that you know, from about stern there is pinching, there is sagging, and that gave the curators a really good understanding of the, of the condition of the, the whole at the time. This was, as I say, this was back in 2009, 2010. As we um, move forward, there are plans to do another survey in the near future to see how that has developed on the, on the previous results. So again, another interesting way of understanding, from, I suppose, from a, a preservation and engineering perspective, what we actually you know, understand about um, vessels in museum exhibits and how we look after them, how we conserve and manage them. And this was done very recently as part of the, 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 the recent conservation plan. Uh, this is the Fifey um, Herring Drifter, um, the, she's the flagship of the museum fleet, um, an operational vessel which unfortunately came to blows in a, in a harbour where the moorings uh, split and she uh, keeled over and there was potentially some damage to the hull. So she was taken to the boatyard in Arbroath where 
we went along, um, uh, myself and a colleague, we did a very quick photogrammetric, photogrammetric exercise, uh, it took about an hour, I went into a meeting, my colleague did the photogrammetric survey, and by the end of the afternoon we'd had this model, um, which we could then discuss with the curators about the potential uh, shift or damage or movement in the hole as a result of the, the accident. So um, luckily there didn't seem to be much um, which then helped inform the boat builders what they needed to concentrate on in terms of repairs. So again, quite useful exercise. Now in a very simplistic way, we're, we're getting even more vernacular now, we're getting into the smaller fishing vessels uh, within the collection, but as part of the uh, management plan and the understanding of these vessels, because they're vernacular, they don't come with plans, they don't come with any sort of uh, engineering directions or boat building directions. They're done by eye, they're done by rule of thumb, they're built by local uh, boat builders. And so very little survives of the actual rec recorded information that you need to be able to inform something like a conservation management plan. So we did very uh, simple photogrammetric exercises on a number of vessels and these are just some examples where we provided a very basic baseline to be able to then inform the interpretation. So this is particularly simplistic, um, and as we'll see uh, in, in, a minute, in a minute, we'll be talking a bit more about HMS Victory, which uh, obviously goes from the small to the, uh, or the small to the ridiculous, or the large. Um, so HMS Victory, we did a conservation plan for Victory back in 2013-2014. There was an extremely detailed laser scan survey commissioned uh, which took months to do uh, with a view to creating um, an intelligent model basically that they could then use to help inform the, the ongoing uh, conservation management of the ship. So uh, has anyone been to H HMS Victory, has anyone seen HMS Victory a couple? So you know the complexity that we're dealing with. These are very large complex vessels with an awful lot of components in this case about 15 to 20,000. Um, but understanding how these components are affected through the conservation process, what is significant, what is not significant, they had to come up with, an, with a, a model, uh, an intelligent model and a process to be able to log and record what is done to the vessel throughout the repair and restoration process. So this is, uh, this is the, the couple of images of the laser scan survey uh, results. Um, some of the point cloud data. What we produced was a very, very detailed gazetteer of all the elements of the ship, all the spaces from, deck, from the top deck right down to into the hold, and also the, the whole external hold itself, uh, with a view to then informing um, uh, a process whereby a, an intelligent model could be developed. Um, and that is what's happened over the last uh, couple of years, um, undertaken by uh, Mike Lobb, um, formerly of the National Museum of the Royal Navy um, and I think at this point I'll just show you that's just an example of the laser scan data you can see all the individual components which have been picked out in the, uh, in the rendition uh, which enabled us archaeologically to phase it um, but as Damien will explain um, from a conservation management perspective the modelling um, is, is equally as important if not more so, so I'll and over to Dan. Thank you. Is that it? Yes. Good, no claps. Um, okay, so um, introduction to information modelling for you guys, in case any of you don't know. Uh, usually, information modelling, people think building information modelling, BIM, uh, and this is what they think. They think a, a fancy 3D model of a building. Uh, but really, uh, BIM is much more exciting than that, and it's really all about this. Um, it's about efficiency, it's about collaboration, it's about data sharing, uh, it's about all this being driven by standards and common working practices, all detailed by publicly available specifications um, that really underlie the entire process and make sure that everyone's working in the same way. So really, building isn't about buildings, it's not a noun, it's a verb. Um, certainly still involves those 3D models um, with the embedded information about each component, but this is about supporting the wider process rather than being an end into itself. Um, so this combination of process and information management 
along with the full 3D model, uh, is what really distinguishes it from a lot of other uh, 3D computing approaches. Um, because Beardmit is really better information management, uh, it can be applied to all sorts of projects um, whenever you're looking to build or manage a complex asset. So increasingly it's being used across different infrastructure projects. Uh, it's also seen a lot of interest in survey industry and also uh, emerging interest in the heritage industry over the last few years. Um, so there are now many different BIM for X kind of special interest groups uh, across these different industries. Um, and although you see a lot of people talking about heritage BIM, uh, because of this we prefer to talk about BIM for heritage uh, and in this case BIM for historic vessels. So uh, why use BIM, why use information modelling for an, an historic vessel? Um, they're extremely complicated assets, um, they have varying geometry, age, condition, significance throughout those assets. Um, they also have complicated conservation and management needs. Uh, there's often a vast array of information associated with them and all this can be used to support that uh, management, um, but it tends to be quite disparate. Um, this can make making informed decisions about how to manage those assets a lot more difficult than necessary needs to be. Um, managing these complex assets, as I say, it's exactly what BIM is for. Um, it creates a, a single source of truth uh, about the asset. And through proper application, uh, we can see many benefits in our management of historic vessels, uh, including uh, improved outcomes and reduced expenditure. Um, so, this leads us on to uh, the Victory BIM Information Modeling, or uh, project, uh, or VIM for short, Victory Information Model. Um, so having produced the uh, Comprehensive Conservation Management Plan uh, that Dan was talking about, uh, and a metric record of the ship, it was decided that a BIM model would be a really useful way of taking that information and supporting its management over the next 15 to, ooh, that's beginning to get, <laughs> over the next 15 to 20 years. Um, giving us the benefits of that more informed management. I'll just hold this so it doesn't collapse. Uh, so the production of the uh, VIM was led by Mike Lobb of the uh, National Museum of Royal Navy uh, and its primary aim was supporting uh, and informing that ongoing conservation work, um, allowing them to understand the significance of each individual component uh, within the structure. Uh, so this ensured that planned alterations to the ship and uh, maintenance work uh, didn't impact on anything that was particularly significant, or if it did, that would at least be understood. Their work is also continuing on the conservation of the victory, uh, and therefore the model as well. It's being updated in line with the work that's being done, so it's very much a, a living reflection of the ship. So, uh, having had this metric information in the CMP, the first step was actually creating that 3D model. Uh, the laser scan was obviously used as the basis for that, uh, and a 3D solid model was created. Um, as Dan said, over 15,000 uh, components within the Victory, each of those modelled individually within this 3D model. Um, essentially, we've got a digital twin of the ship. So there's a, a whole host of BIM software packages out there that's usually used in the AEC industry. Not really appropriate for what's happening with the uh, Victory due to its very complex geometry. Uh, so Rhino, uh, Rhino was used instead to um, model the individual co uh, components and then they were hyperlinked through to an access database that stored all of the uh, extra information uh, about them. Um, it also meant that the information could be easily accessed separately from the 3D model so that pretty much anyone can access it if they need to, no matter their technical ability or their or the computing power. So, uh, obviously a wealth of information about the HOS Victory. Uh, not all of this is relevant to the ship's conservation and management. There's a, a tendency when people talk BIM and heritage to go, let's chuck everything in. Um, this can be you know, source for all of our information. It doesn't really need to be that, uh, so only the relevant information has been put in. In this case, we've got physical information about the uh, condition, weight, timber species, etc. Uh, archaeological information such as shipwright marks, uh, analysis of the timber technology, and then also subjective values like significance. 
So, as I say, the creation of the VIM is a, an ongoing process. It's going to continue to be used and updated in tandem with the conservation work. Um, there have obviously been some challenges with the project, as I mentioned, lack of really appropriate software. Um, and although there are standards and specifications for normal BIM work, there's not really anything um, for heritage work yet. Um, these specifications they need to be written, they need to be agreed upon. Um, once this is done, we can really push forward with information modeling in heritage, um, and maybe then we can start to get the software that properly backs up what we need to do. Um, Working with VIMS has led to a great understanding of what is required, what is required, how this process can work within a heritage context, in particular in relation to historic vessels. Uh, and it's clear that there's a great deal of potential there. Uh, we've got complex assets, complex needs, and a large amount of information. Um, and BIM is really a process and a technology that can help us manage that better. So uh, this has been a bit of a whistle to uh, stop tour from both of us. Um, if you would like to learn more, obviously you can talk to us. Uh, but also there is a, uh, we've got an article coming out in uh, a publication in January in 3D recording and interpretation for maritime archaeology volume. Uh, so look out for that. Uh, thanks very much.